Everybody, how's it going? It's late in the evening for me. I'm going to go pretty fast with this. Again, you're going to need to pause. There's probably some announcements I need. I'm going to worry about those uh, tomorrow. I'm just going to get on this. The good news is, as you, those of you that already printed off your sheet, it's not that long. And so I want this to be short. If I have time at the end, I'll have a fun little commercial then. But I will start off with a joke. Alexa, tell me a joke. What was Baby Banana's first word? Yellow. Yellow, get it? Yeah, okay, that was dumb. All right, so we're going to fly right into this. The name of this PowerPoint is called Mark versus Leo the 13th. You know I know that? It says it right there. So, let's continue. What is Mark's document called? Well, we all know that's the Communist Manifesto and the year 1848. Again, you're going to need to pause because I'm going to fly right here. Communist Manifesto, 1848. But I'm going to take my little red dot there for you. And you guessed it. The next question is Leo XIII's document, and that's Rerum Novarum. And that year was 1891 which if you take 1492 and you add 399, you get 1891. Pretty good, ain't it? All right, let's keep going. And for Marx, what is the class struggle really between the bourgeoisie and the proletarian? Red dot, please. Bourgeoisie, proletarian. Pause it if you need it. I'm booking. Okay, here we go. Historical background. You paying attention over here? Very good. Before Marx ever wrote, society was changing. The Industrial Revolution introduced something new to society. What was that? Factory. Notice it's underlined. That should be a hint. So I hope you're paying attention because we're going fast. And more people started moving where? To the city. So I'll give you a hint. This is actually number four. And there's a second part to number four. The factory owners, the bourgeoisie, took advantage of the situation. So they owned the factories, the other people were the workers. And they, they weren't very nice about it in some cases either. So they obviously, the next answer is who owned the factories, the bourgeoisie. So. They tried to pay the workers the least amount possible, and sometimes the work conditions were very terrible. Remember, you got to pause. Okay. Five, six, and seven are all here. For Marx, who rose to power in the French Revolution? The bourgeoisie. Okay. Then, for Marx, who needed to rise to power in another revolution? Because remember, the French Revolution just ended when he's writing this 50 years ago. And that was a rebellion to stop feudalism. So, who do you think? The proletarian. They're now the serfs as he sees it. And for Marx, what class of people need to be eliminated? This is new. Who would that be? The bourgeoisie. So, there you have it. Five, six, seven. If you're having trouble, pause right now. Some of the problems. These are problems that were out there. We all know about it. Child labor. So it lists three problems. Notice that this is underlined and there's a sentence explaining it. Obviously, you don't need to put that sentence there. They, oops, sorry about that. They like hiring young kids. They might be able to get into small areas that they could pay, and they could pay them less, sometimes a fraction of the cost. So they love child labor. Then, unhealthy conditions. There were not laws preventing workers to work in dangerous conditions. A YouTube I saw that I got some of my information from, this guy said that in one of the places, a match factory, some of the chemicals made the kids' teeth fall out. So it was sometimes terrible conditions. Long hours. Again, with no laws, they can make them work 12 hours a day and every day if they wanted to. So you can see the other one is long hours. Again, if you need to pause it, pause it. Now we move on. 
Marx recaps history in the Communist Manifesto. He traced the, ri the rise of the bourgeoisie and how capitalism had taken over from feudalism. So now he says we rebelled against feudalism. We now need to rebel against uh, the uh, capitalism. So this would be the answer for number nine, feudalism. And for Marx, what did capitalism grow from? Feudalism. Yeah, I thought I did that. Uh, and wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few, and the vast majority was living in poverty. So to give you a hint, the vast majority one is number 10. Number 10. So now we're at number 11, and then we'll go on. And Marx calls the workers slaves. And Marx felt that this was a worse system than feudalism. So number 11 was a yes or no, the other half. You can guess that. Read it. Pause it if you need it. You know where that pause button is. We're moving on. Freeze it. We're moving on. Marx felt that it was time for another revolt AKA just like the French Revolution. I didn't know that was there. All right. Marx thinks the revolution has to happen. Marx predicts a revolution because of the poor conditions. Marx says that everything will fall. Law, religion, morality, and family. He thinks all this is bourgeoisie. So you get rid of the bourgeoisie, you don't need any of this anymore. That's why Engels was against marriage. It's too bourgeois for him. So, number 12, did Marx think it was time for another revolution? Yes. Number 13, uh, the four things that were fall would fall are right here. So get those down. Now, we're at, that was actually 13. 14 is who's supposed to own all means of production? That was the workers. They're supposed to own everything. That simple one, you already have it written down. And uh, let me go back. In case you need to freeze it, freeze it now. Okay, now we're moving on. What does Pope Leo XIII say? Does Pope Leo XIII agree with Marx about the problem, which is number 15? The answer is yes. He sees there are many injustices towards the workers. He doesn't argue with that. He knows what's going on. And he says technology has changed things greatly. Obviously, that's probably 16. And there is a spirit of revolutionary change in the air. There is a conflict raging between the masters and the workmen. So he doesn't like that. The conflict is growing. And some have made enormous fortunes, the bourgeoisie. He recognizes that. He sees the unfairness of it, the injustice. So he agrees a lot with Marx at the, what's the source of the problem. And finally, many living in poverty of the masses, the proletarian, which of course is not even on here. So, number 18 is next. So, freeze this if you need it. And now. Oh, sorry. Morality is declining. He also saw that too. Oh, there's another one. Everyone's talking about solutions. I didn't put questions on those. He just pointed those out. All right, fundamental disagreement with Marx. Marx sees religion as a problem. The masses become passive, like if they were drugged. Christians won't rise up in revolution. They're too mellow. So he says, so what does he call it? He calls Christianity religion is the opium of the people. So that's what you need to write for number 18. Okay? The religion is the opium. I know we had it. Bear with me. Write it down again. Religion is the opium of the people. I don't know how many times. I was just reading an article two, three articles over the last three days when I'm eating my meal alone, you know. Anyway, um, every one of them was taught, they would mention Marx, they would mention Nietzsche, they would mention Freud. Every single one of them mentioned one of those guys, sometimes all three of them. 
So what we're talking about is very fundamental to understanding our culture. So let's keep going. Now, what the Pope says, Leo says the opposite is needed. We need more religion so that we can recognize the dignity of the human person. One thing religion does, it recognizes the dignity of the human person. That's why Christians are all against abortion. We recognize the dignity of that baby. So that's number 19. It's underlined. Again, if you need to pause it, please pause it. And Christian morality actually defines how we are to treat our neighbor. Because we have commandments, precepts, a whole bunch of Christian doctrine on how we're supposed to love our neighbor. So once again, that would be the number 20. Now, number 21, name three of Mark's solutions. Oh, I forgot something. If you need to pause it, pause it now. Okay. What is Mark's solution? Number one, notice that this is underlined. Evolution of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purses. In plain English, which I know you guys like, the government takes all the land from the rich. That's what he's talking about. And you know why he's at it? He might as well take the land from the poor. Which, of course, he, uh, when Lenin came, they did. All right. A heavy income tax. That's the second one. So if you're making too much money, we're going to take that money. The obligation of all rights of inheritance. No right to inheritance. And final one. Confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. In other words, taking prop property from anyone who disagrees with the revolution. So that's what they would do. You don't like the revolution? We're taking your property. Because you must be a capitalist. So, if you need to pause, and I hope there's not a five, but pause now. All right, there wasn't. Mark's solution continues. And we're on 22. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and exclusive monopoly. In other words, there's your answer. State controls all banks. So that was a yes or no. 22 is a yes or no. You can do it. Okay, 23. Centralization of the means of communication and transportation in the hands of the state. The state controls all communications and travel, which would be back then just newspapers for the most part. And then, and the telegraph, I should say too, because Lenin took that control of that right away. Now it would be uh, all the news media, uh, the state controlled TV, state controlled radio stations, state controlled newspapers, state controlled magazines. And in communist China, it's all state controlled. Uh, all factories owned by the state. So now there's no private ownership of the factories. It's all the government that's running it. So, number 24 and number 25, no, 24 is right here. Then, so number 23, you already wrote that down. Um, the state controls all communications and travel. So again, I'll give you time to pause it. So that's number 23, which you have to write all this out, by the way. Number 24 uh, is the state or the government. And number 25 for Marx, who should be, com what should be combined with industrial production? And that would be education. Education should only be teaching people what they need to know to be a good worker. You know, all these other things, Marx doesn't see anything. He says it should be combined with industrial production. He wanted to control all schools, and he wanted to spread the population between the city and the, and the countryside. That never worked. Okay, so you can pause it if you need it. Pause. And now we move on. For Marx, where do we start? First step, have workers revolt against the capitalists. 
And we're on the back side. Are we burning rubber or what? So, number 26, right there. Write it out. And remember, it's up to you to pause it, not me. Number 27, the second step, take all property from the capitalists. So what should be taken from all the capitalists? All the property, not some of it, all of it, okay? Step three, eliminate the capitalists and the current government. Why? Because the current government didn't stop the capitalists, so they need to be eliminated. So does elimination mean killing? Well, when Lenin did it, that's what he did. So apparently, that's the way he read it. So eliminate the capitalists and the current government. So there you have 27, or 26, 27, 28. And number 29, what should be set up to control the transition? A dictatorship. There has to be one person that's going to make this work, okay? So that's what Mark said, it's okay. But sooner, then what happens is, once everything is set the way you, you Mark, Mark's talked about it, you're gonna live happily ever after. Everybody in communist Russia are gonna be so happy, and they weren't. Everybody in communist China, are so happy, they're not. But that was a promise. You'll live happily ever after. You gotta have promises. So, now that was number 30. Oh look, we have two 30s. Go, imagine that. Okay, wait. If you need to pause it, pause it now. Okay, now we're moving on. The Pope Leo's, the 13th solution, employers should not look at their workers as slaves. So he's scolding them. You know, how dare you guys do this? That's the other 30. Number 31, they are obliged to treat them with respect as children of God. So he said, look, you owe these people respect. So he's kind of shaming them across the whole world, really to get them to think. And it, it did actually work. To treat people like things to use for a profit is truly shameful and inhuman. So he's really, he's really jabbing at him. Look, if you guys treat people like this, you're inhuman. So it did wake up a lot of people. Workers should form unions and associations. Unions weren't like they are now. They weren't so big and powerful. They were just the workers uniting to be able to make sure that their rights would be, uh, would be kept. And so, apparently at that time, they were wrestling if unions should be legal or not, and the Pope says, no, these, place, these have a rightful place uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the world, you know, in the, in, um, in the world. So, yeah, so he, he put that in there so that it would be allowed. And so that was number 32. Number 33, is that on here? Yeah, it is. Oops, sorry, that was a, I hit it twice. The government, sorry, the government needs to step in and protect the worker from harmful situations. And I don't have a question for that. Okay, if you need to freeze it, freeze it. All right, we move on. There's a picture of Pope Leo the Thirteenth way over here. So in that case, there. All right, let's continue here. I hope you know, oh no, yeah, we're on 33. Hence, it is clear that the main tenets of socialism, so problems of socialism, a community of goods must be utterly rejected. And for what reasons? It injures those whom it seems meant to benefit. benefit. So 33, if you can't figure that one out, you got problems. It is directly contrary to the natural rights of mankind. So it says 34, the Pope says socialism is directly contrary to the natural rights of mankind. Again, this is very simple. I'm not going to stay there. Would it, it would also introduce confusion disorder in the commonwealth, into the, in the whole government, in, with peoples. It takes away private property. And so number 35, the Pope said socialism takes away private property. And I could, 
actually go quite on about private property, but again, I purposely made this short. And the right to private property is a principle of natural law. That's number 36. So, 37 may be on the next one. So right now, I'm going to pause for you to pause. Okay, done pausing. Up oh, there it is. By taking away private property, it takes away the right to be creative in building things and providing for one's family. Okay, which is not on here. So, now you can pause it, but I'm moving on. Okay, here he says, so, he says, and I quote, We speak of the sect of men who under various and almost barbarous names are called socialists, communists, or nihilists, and who spread over all the world and bound together by the closest ties in a wicked confederacy, no longer seek the shelter of secret meetings, but openly and boldly marching forth in the light of day, strive to bring to a head what they have long planned, the overthrow of all civil societies. So first he says they, they, the, uh, this people are using the name socialist, communist, and nihilist. He put them all together, and yes, that's the answer for number 37. It's underlined. Pause it if you need it. But notice how strong it is. He says these socialists, these communists, these nihilists, are there to what they've all long been planned, the overthrow of all civil society. Wow, those are strong words, and I personally believe them. Surely these are they who, as the sacred scripture testify, defile the flesh, despise dominion, as blaspheme majesty. Wow. So there's your uh, number 38. Obviously 38 is going to be circled. If you need to pause it, pause it now. Okay, 39. Now this is pious. It's already been, oh, he's, uh, there's already been a pope in between him and Leo the 13th. So they ask him, he was asked if socialism was okay if they would just take out the anti-Christian part. And how did he answer? Whether considered as a doctrine or historical fact or a movement, socialism, if it remains truly socialism, even after it has yielded to the truth and justice on the points which we have mentioned, meaning that it was more Christian-like, more God-friendly, cannot be, oh sorry, cannot be reconciled with the teachings of the Catholic Church because, and here's the because, its concept of society itself is utterly foreign to Christian truth. So number 39 is underlined for you in bold print. It, its concepts of society, its view of society itself, is utterly foreign to Christian truth. They cannot, cannot be reconciled. So if you need to pause it, please pause it now and start writing. Pause. Okay, I'm going to end with a final quote. And this is from Archbishop Sheen who actually had a radio, or excuse me, a TV program that was on uh, prime time. And uh, everybody across the United States saw him. This is what he said about communism. That did this get put on because I just read the article about an hour ago. And he said, communism is the mystical body of the Antichrist. And this is what he called, and actually he's up for sainthood. He'd already be canonized as saint, but there were some bishops interfered from it. So someday I'll be Saint Archbishop Fulton Sheen. So here's his quote. Communism persecutes all religion because it claims to be the one true religion and hence can suffer no other. It is the religion of the kingdom of earth. 
The religion which renders to Caesar even the things that are God's. It is the body of the elect, the new Israel, the ape of Christianity in all externals. So, you can see these are very, very strong words. And if I was to continue the uh, worksheet, we would be focusing on that it is, it's a religion of the kingdom of earth, not the kingdom of God. So we did really good on time. And so I'll probably add another little clip of uh, me many years ago at the seminary doing the Ron and Ron show. Um, if there's any other announcements, like I said, I'm going to do that later. Get this done, scan it, send it to me, and you're done for the week. All right? Just talk to you later. And we're back. And Ron, you going to give us a note or two? Yes, I've been practicing while you've been watching that show. And <clears throat> Listen. That's very good, Ron. Um, thank you very much. Uh, maybe, maybe you should like do that um, little commercial thing we have. Oh yes, I'll announce this. We have a meeting. Uh, we need help here at WMSM TV. We have a meeting on Sunday at 6 p.m. And Bosco's helping us out today, so please come. We need, we need cameramen. We need everybody else. So just help us out here. 6 p.m. Sunday nights. Now we're going to go to Deacon Glenn Harris in the Catholic moment. Okay. Let's see. Well, what'd you think of that, Ron? Oh, I, I'm sorry I wasn't watching. Oh, we just came back from the Catholic moment. Oh, I'm sure Glenn was good as usual. And can I tell you something? We didn't even, even have her on. And here's Bosco. Look at him. Such a calm furball. Yes, very calm. Ron, do you have anything else before we uh, leave? Well, just our usual ending, and that is, you never know what we're going to do because we don't know what we're going to do. Thank you. That's right. All right. Have a good night. Good night, Ron. Uh, good night, Ron. How about a good night note <clears throat> for you and Bosco? Good night, Bosco.